Hello, I'm Joel Woodruff, president of the C.S. Lewis Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the CSLI event with award-winning author Russ Ramsey, titled Discovering Beauty, Goodness, and Truth, How Artists and Their Art Can Point Us to the Creator. In our visually oriented world, media, film, and art shape our minds for good or for bad using illustrative images. In today's interview, rather than passively allowing ourselves to be inundated with the world's images, we'll be exploring with author Russ Ramsey some ways in which we can intentionally pursue beauty, goodness, and truth through the lens of great artists and art. This, in turn, can point us to our Creator, God Almighty, who gave us the ability to create, and this fits right within the target of the mission of the C.S. Lewis Institute. For those not familiar with uh, CSLI, we were founded 47 years ago as a servant ministry to the church for the purpose of helping develop disciples of Jesus Christ who articulate, defend, share, and live their faith both in personal and public life. Our Heart and Mind Discipleship Ministry now has 17 locations in the United States, Canada, and Northern Ireland, and people around the world download and use the small group resources, articles, audio and video materials, and podcasts available through our award-winning website. Our flagship program, the year-long, tuition-free C.S. Lewis Fellows Program, has equipped over 5,000 men and women to date to become effective disciples of Jesus Christ. The program includes Bible study, lectures, mentoring, small groups, and training in spiritual formation, discipleship, conversational apologetics, and evangelism to develop servant leaders for the workplace, church, and home. It's designed so that even busy working professionals can complete the program while maintaining their work, church, and family life. The CSLI Fellows Program is offered in the following locations, Annapolis, Maryland, Atlanta, Belfast, Northern Ireland, Central Pennsylvania, Charleston, South Carolina, Chicago, Charlotte, North Carolina, Cincinnati, Dallas, Greenville, South Carolina, Loudoun County, Virginia, Naples, Florida, Northeast Ohio, Virginia Beach, Seattle, Toronto, Ontario, and Washington, D.C. If you live in one of these areas and would like more information on this program for men and women ages 24 to 104, please check out our website under Fellows Program. The 2324 class application period is open now and uh, you can begin applying uh, today. If you haven't yet subscribed to receive our free digital discipleship resources and announcements about upcoming CSLI events, I encourage you to do that as well. You can click on the chat room button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to find links to CSLI resources and our website. Now please join me in prayer as we uh, pray for our time together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are the great creator, you're the great artist, and I thank you for the ways in which you have given your people the ability to uh, create things of beauty and goodness and truth. And I thank you for Russ Ramsey for his thoughtfulness and research and insights. And we pray that today as we discuss art and faith and how we can learn uh, from them, that you would just guide our discussion and may it be inspiring and a blessing to all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest. Russ Ramsey is a pastor at Christ Presbyterian Church in Nashville, Tennessee. He's at the Cool Springs Campus at Church. What a great name. Uh, he's married, has four children. Uh, he's an award-winning author in his most recent book, uh, pull it out here, uh, Rembrandt is in the Wind, Learning to Love Art Through the Eyes of Faith. This will be the subject of our interview today. Russ is active on social media and his art Wednesday. Uh, reflections on beauty and art are posted on guess what day? On Wednesdays on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. He's a graduate of Taylor University and Covenant Theological Seminary. Russ, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a joy to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, great. Well, as a way of introduction, uh, could you please just share how you came to faith in Christ and a little bit about your own spiritual journey? Yeah, yeah. I uh, when I, when when I was born, neither of my parents were Christians, and and they became Christians uh, when I was about five years old. And so my introduction to um, to the church uh, came by way of of uh, first generation Christianity. So n nothing cultural, nothing. Um, it was them just coming to discover who who Christ was, and uh, so. I got to be a part of that growing up, and uh, the Lord um, was always 
present in my life. I, I became a believer. Um, I knew I was a Christian, I guess, what may be a better way to say it when I, when I was uh, about 15 years old. And um, uh, as just, I was at a, a, a youth retreat um, and just kind of had this moment where it, there was no altar call or anything, but there was just a moment where, where I realized that, that I, that Jesus was real, uh, in my life. And, and I knew in that moment that, that everything moving forward in my life would be affected in some way by that. Uh, and, uh, that is born itself out. That's, that's true. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I, I ended up at Taylor university, uh, and through the course of being there, um, the Lord started uh, working a call in my life to, to pastoral work, uh, pastoral ministry and, and working with words. Uh, and, um, that's been the trajectory that I've, I've been on ever since. And, uh, so it's been 30, oh gosh, 34 years now since then. Oh, that's great. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, you mentioned, um, your time in, at, uh, at Taylor University, uh, your own, uh, I suppose, vocational interests began to get shaped there. And you mentioned uh, an interest in writing and kind of mm -hmm. creative things. Like, tell us, how, how did you become interested in kind of creative aspects of life, writing, art, artists, that type of thing? I've always had that disposition. I've, I've, I've always been the, the, the kid who was in, interested in learning instruments and, and writing songs and, and things like that. I started doing that early, actually. That was, that was my... Um, my my first creative love was songwriting and um uh which involves you know working with words carefully and 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 uh and the consternation of trying to work with words carefully uh you know how difficult that is and it's something that just has has always been a deep deep uh thrill for me has been has been working with language and words and trying to communicate things um, in artistic ways. When it, when it comes to the visual arts, that that was something that I was always, I always loved drawing and, and that, but I had great, uh, I grew up in central Indiana uh, in a small farming town. And I was blessed to have art teachers who wanted to instill in us, their students, a lifelong appreciation of the arts. And one of my art teachers, in fact, I dedicated this book to them. Uh, it's dedicated to my art teachers from middle school and high school. And um, my art teacher in high school gave us this advice. She said, if you want to have a lifelong relationship with the arts, find an artist that you connect with and then just pay attention to them for the rest of your life. And they will introduce you to their mentors. They'll introduce you to their colleagues. Um, you'll go visit them at museums and, and on the walls next to them will be others and you'll get to know them. And, and it'll be this deepening understanding and appreciation of, of art, but from a uh, relational way rather than an, art, an academic way. And so that's what I did. It was Van Gogh for me. Um, and Rembrandt. And uh, lo and behold, you know, Van Gogh introduced me to the Impressionists and Rembrandt in introduced me to the, the Renaissance painters and, and, and on it's gone. And, and uh, so that's, that's a lot of how I um, have engaged with the arts ever since is just, um, just paying attention to things that I like uh, and, uh, and wanting and just having a general posture of curiosity toward all of it. Uh, what a great uh, word of advice from your art teachers <laughs> in middle school yeah. and just their relational approach. Uh, I think that's fantastic. I, I share something with you. I grew up in, in a small uh, farming community in central Missouri, and, and our community also had a strong interest in the arts. And it's amazing how that can impact your life uh, and uh, as mm -hmm. you think about uh, seeing things in, in new ways. Well, uh, you mentioned um, a beginning with uh, Van Gogh and then leading to Rembrandt. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit. What is it about Rembrandt? Uh, you, in fact, you titled your book here. You know, Rembrandt is in the wind. Um, what is it about Rembrandt that seems to touch uh, people when it comes to spiritual issues? Uh, Henry Nowen wrote a, a famous book that we use. I know in some of our fellow fellows programs uh, about the, the return of the prodigal. Uh, maybe tell us what what is it about him that that seems to connect still with people today in that in that sense. Yeah, you know, when it, when you when you're in the hands of a great painter, um, they're not just showing you a picture; they're telling you a story. And when you engage with the picture, um, whether it's a painting, Rembrandt's uh, Return of the Prodigal Son is a perfect example of this, where your eye follow your eye follows a path 
when you look at that painting. You see you, your eye is going to be drawn to something first and then second and then third and fourth. And before you know it, a story is unfolded, not just a picture. And Rembrandt had this way of um, telling stories visually that had a profundity to them that that for me as a as a teenager i would i would just sort of fall into the paintings i i, I would I, I would be so taken by the the drama and the expressions and the uh the, the I, I didn't know it at the time i had I, it was something that i learned later um that this idea that we look at a painting in sequence um but we do and and uh, in fact it, you should try it if you you know look at a look at a painting and and just kind of pay attention to what's the path that your eye follows um and how does that unfold a story but but yeah he he has this way of of bringing to me so much heart into stories, particularly biblical stories that have so much familiarity to them. And yet um, the way that they unfold and the, and the, 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 the affection and the tenderness in people's eyes, the way that he painted that sort of thing and the drama and the scale uh, and the contrast of light and dark um, there's just, it's a dramatic experience uh, to, to, you know, to take in a Rembrandt. So, so I hear, hear you correctly. You're saying that some artists actually are, very intentional about uh, telling a story through the art. I mean, I think oftentimes we just think of, you know, artists as yeah. reflecting something they see and just, uh, so, mm -hmm. but, but there's a lot more to it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm, you're, you're getting worked. Uh, when, when you, when you walk up to a painting uh, by an artist who knows what they're doing, they, they take you somewhere. Um, and, and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in fact, I, uh, with, with the art, you mentioned Art Wednesday, the series that I do on social media. One of those Art Wednesdays I dedicated to the visual path of a painting and gave several, like posted seven or eight different paintings to look at and just pay attention to where does your eye go first? Because with Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son, um, you go, your eye immediately goes to the embrace between the father and the, and the younger brother. Um, and then your eye goes to the older brother who is he's he's not as illuminated as the father and the son but he's the he's the the next most illuminated character and then you follow his his eyes he's kind of looking down into the side and in the process of doing that you start to see the other people in varying degrees of presence um you know somebody in a doorway somebody back in the shadow uh and and so it's this kind of inventory of, of who's there and what's happening and how are they engaging with the moment and um, yeah, it's it, it's a it's a fascinating thing. It's why it's why um, it's why so much art has endured over time is that is that it's uh, it's not just that you're looking at something that's really detailed and complex, but you're looking at something that is is telling you something um, in a narrative form, even though there's no motion to it. It's or it's not moving. It's just it's a still frame, but it's a story that's unfolding in your mind as you engage with it. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about the um, uh, the cover of your book is another Rembrandt uh, painting. Um, uh, can you tell us about that one um, and kind of what's behind the, this, this painting of Rembrandt uh, yeah. uh, in, the, in the Sea of Galilee there? Yeah, it's Rembrandt's only seascape, um, The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. It was stolen in March of 1990 from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, uh, part of an art heist where 13 pieces of work went, went missing, um, worth an estimated $500 million. It was the single largest property theft in American history at the time. And, um, and they've not been seen since. Um, I, I doubt they will ever be recovered. I, my, my hope, my, my, not my hope. <laughs> I hope they're recovered. My guess is that they've been destroyed, um, which is tragic. Uh, but, but the Rembrandt painting, uh, was cut out of its frame uh, with, a, with a razor knife uh, and rolled up and taken out. And if you go to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum today, the frame is still on the wall. It's just empty. Uh, and there's reason for that, which I get into in the book, why that frame is still there. Um, there's a legal reason why. Um, but uh, the painting itself is uh, so compelling. In fact, it is the painting that drew me to Rembrandt. It was that one. Uh, I saw that in high school. Um, it had not yet been stolen. Um, and, uh, 
And one of the things that's so cool about that painting is Rembrandt paints himself into it. He's one of the disciples in the boat. Um, and when you look at the painting, the grouping of, of disciples, there's uh, six of them on one side trying to wake Jesus and get him to do something. And then the other six are on the other side, and they're struggling with the boat and trying to just keep it from sinking. And Rembrandt is uh, standing in the, f- in the foreground of the boat looking at the viewer He's got his hand on his hat and he's holding onto a rope and he's looking directly at you or me, you know? And, uh, and so the title of the book Rembrandt is in the wind is kind of a play on the idea that he's actually in the boat in the wind, but also something being in the wind is a euphemism for something that has been stolen and not yet recovered. And so, uh, so that's the, that's the play on the title. But, but what I love about that is, is when Rembrandt breaks that fourth wall and looks at the viewer it's a way that he is inviting the viewer into the painting as well. It's his way of saying to us, the viewer, do, 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 do you feel it too, um, that we're perishing here? Um, and, um, and it's, it's a really fascinating way that a painter will engage a viewer on a very personal level. Um, if you ever see a painting, uh, where one of the figures in the painting is looking out at the viewer, the odds are decent that it's the artists themselves. Um, and it's their way of drawing you in as well. So you're not just a spectator, but you're a participant in the unfolding drama and the scene there. Um, so yeah, that's that, that painting is, is, uh, has long been uh, one of my favorites. Wow. Now um, it is interesting. I mean, th- that's obviously uh depiction of a biblical scene, uh, as is the the prodigal son of Rembrandt. How would you um, maybe describe the difference between, let's say, hearing a sermon on Sunday morning from a biblical passage uh, versus seeing it expressed through a piece of art? And and, uh, and how does that communicate to our hearts and minds? And what what are the positives, uh, negatives uh, in in those two different kinds of approaches? We're so familiar, I think, with with the word, hearing it, but seeing it as just another way of doing it. Yeah, it is. Um, in our church, I've I've decorated our church with high quality reproductions of a lot of famous paintings, including Storm on the Sea of Galilee and Return of the Prodigal Son. And we have some Monet and Van Gogh and Caravaggio and others. Um, and one of the reasons that I do that, that I put this art everywhere uh, in our in our church, is because I th- I believe that we um, that the way human beings interact visually with things is that we we sort of form personal collections uh, that we carry around in our imaginations and in our hearts of things that we see, paintings that we've connected with that we've said I really like this one. When I see it, I I kind of feel like it's one of mine, and uh, and so the collection that we've put here in the church has been intentionally uh, an attempt on my part to, um, to kind of supply paintings for people's personal collections, because we carry these things around with us and we, we think about the, we think about them. We think about the composition and what's happening and the detail and the drama and the, um, just sort of the mystery too, of, of something that was painted 400 years ago or 500 years ago, um, still being regarded, uh, globally, as as an irreplaceable transcendent uh, piece of art, the Lord made us to be people who don't just learn things didactically. We don't we don't just learn, um, you know. Tell me how a plus b equals c. Uh, we learn by way of story, and that's what a lot of visual art is: is it's storytelling. And when you think about the way that Jesus taught. Uh, his primary method of teaching was, you know, there was a man uh, who had great wealth. You know, he told stories. And um, and it's because stories uh, have a way of, uh, w- w- stories are a Trojan horse for truth. You can slip a lot past the defenses of, of a person's heart by just telling them a story. Uh, in fact, uh, Flannery O'Connor said a story is a way of saying something that can't be said in any other way. And when I think of visual art, most of what I'm thinking about is is it storytelling, um, which is what the book is really. The book is storytelling. It's it's just telling the stories about the stories. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's and so you know for sermons, you, you know I, I the, you know I, I I joke with people that I basically write an eight page paper a week. That's my that's my job, um, or one of my jobs. And and uh, you know there's something about being together. Uh, in a congregational setting where, where we're all in a room together and we're hearing 
um, something that is being has been prepared and now is being delivered. Um, as a preacher, if I have a hundred people in the room, I'm assuming that that people are hearing a hundred different sermons. Um, you know that the Lord is doing what He's doing, and 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 I can't really predict uh, how He's going to work through that. But there's something about the the communal nature of of hearing Scripture exposited, unpacked um, that that is a uh, and the rhythm of it, I think that is that is a beautiful thing. Um, but with art, um, it's not so much the rhythm of engaging with art as much as it is the the um, the hiding it away, uh, and and it, it it residing in your heart and and you, you carrying it around with you. Um, but uh, it's it, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what else I would say. Do you do you ever combine? Um... Art in a sermon. Have you done that occasionally? Oh, how, yeah. does that, how does that work? What oh yeah, that I like? love to do that. I, I love to because it's another way of adding to people's personal collections, right? Is I'll I'll um, oftentimes try if if there's if there's some connection that I can make to a painting. Um, I love to put a painting in front of people as a way of of kind of giving them some a deeper a deeper appreciation and and familiarity uh, with art, but also it's. It, it is true uh, that art has a transcendent quality to it um, that is going to be a, a little different typically uh, than if I'm telling stories about, um, you know, um, a boxer or something like that, you know, to, to show people a, a picture. Art art has a way of of engaging people on on multiple levels of our of, a, of the human experience. Yeah, uh, I think even. Uh... A lot of modern educational research, you know, points out that uh, uh, that we really are we need that visual learning, and and of course, mm -hmm. the society bombards us with visuals all the time, and it just wires the brain in in different ways. And uh, I think some have actually found that the, the least effective means is, you know, one person speaking and hundreds of people listening. But if you combine the visual and the aud the auditory, it seems like a, a very powerful combination. Um, what um, what would be some of the uh, other artists? Uh, that you personally have found uh, uh, to impact your life and have you found helpful in, in spiritual matters? Yeah. Uh, so Caravaggio is one uh, that is, he's a mystery to me because he was this, um, this paradox of corruption and grace. Uh, he, when you look at Caravaggio's paintings and his interpretations of scriptural events, they are rich and they're deep and they have a, a pretty profound sense of the wonder of forgiveness and, and, the, and the compassion of Christ. And yet he was a carouser. He murdered a couple of people. He, he was, uh, uh, one of his biographers said that Caravaggio, uh, uh, that for Caravaggio, there was only carnival and Lent and nothing in between, uh, that he would, um, paint these paintings like the 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 incredulity of of saint thomas which is the the famous painting of jesus guiding thomas's finger into the wound in his side um and he would paint these 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 scenes like this that just arrest you uh then he'd get the commission and he'd go out and he'd spend it all on drink and 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 women and and uh and he'd brawl and and then he'd cloister himself off and he'd spend three months painting this, another transcendent biblical story. And then, and it, what's fascinating to me is everybody I know is like that in some way, um, that, that we're all these paradoxes of corruption and grace. We all, we all have a need for the forgiveness, uh, that he painted so beautifully. Um, and he's a, he's an example of somebody that I look at and I think, okay, he complicates for me in a way that I think is healthy. He complicates for me my my desire to just be really binary in the way I think about people. You know that you have good people and you have bad people, and you have folks who have got it figured out and folks who don't have it figured out. And and he's he's sort of a uh, an extreme caricature um, because of the brilliance of his art um, of of that that picture. And so <laughs> it's, it's one of the things I've learned as somebody who studies artists is that there are very very few that I would hold up as the example for how to live. Artists tend to be tortured souls. And um, I, I always have to approach with a little bit of trepidation um, 
how much do I really want to know about Rembrandt? <laughs> how much do I really want to know about Van Gogh? Um, uh, because they're, they're beautiful and their lives are formed and their art is formed through suffering um, and through a desperate need for the gospel to be true. Um, but they're also messy uh, and uh, possessing anything far from a perfect record. I remember uh, years ago in uh, asking some college students if they would ever sing worship songs written by an adulterer or murderer. And it was kind of interesting, mm -hmm. the responses. I mean, many said, no, no way would we do that. But then we said, well, how about King David and <laughs> the Bible yeah. and yeah. all the Psalms? And so I think you have something there, there that, you know, we're all sinners. Uh, hopefully we've mm -hmm. found the salvation through grace and faith in Christ uh, to rescue us. But uh, yeah, we are creating the image of God, but have a still are fallen in nature. So it's true. We're not uh, just all good or bad in that regard. So that's, that's, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as you've shared a little bit about, you know, these artists, uh, what would you be some of the traits you think that, that have made them a great artists? What was it that in their background or mm -hmm. their personalities, or was it just pure talent? And what was it that, that shaped them to be able to communicate in such powerful ways through art? In a word, suffering. Uh, it's that's the theme that I see running through. Um, some of them uh, suffering shaped a, um, a a tenderness and a humility uh, that you see evolve in in a in a painter's career. Like Rembrandt is a good example of of you know when you look at the things that he painted when he was in his twenties. Uh, he's flexing. He's showing what he's capable of, and he's kind of winking at the camera and kissing his bicep. You know, like uh, like that's kind of when I see his earlier stuff. That's all so intricate and detailed and just right. Um, but when he gets older, uh, he suffered a lot. He's he's you know buried people, his wife and his and children that he's loved, and and he's lost a career. Uh, he's lost money. He's lost fame. Um, and his paintings become much more intimate and tender, uh, and, uh, and also defiant, uh, like there's a, a kind of a resolve in him to, uh, to present the, the tenderness and the affection of the Lord, um, at the end of his life that, that is, uh, th that you see creep in over time. Van Gogh is the same way. Um, and then you have artists like Edward Hopper, uh, who I write about. There's a chapter f devoted to his work um, where his suffering was was a kind of a misery that he leaned into and he rejected God. Uh, and and it, it also bears itself out in his work that his suffering uh, has left us with this incredible body of work that is so lonely. Uh, when you look at his paintings, there's just this lonesomeness to it that that f for human beings we we recognize uh, one a, a loneliness there that we feel, um, but two the wrongness of it. We, we it, the hollowness, the emptiness of it is so palpable uh, in his work um, as well. And so suffering is is the thread uh, for me that that seems to run through these stories uh, that, that so captivate me and that, and that draw me in that they're trying, they're trying to, uh, to tell the truth um, about living in a world that's hard to live in. And that is attractive to me. Yeah. So would you say, uh, at least those of us who aren't artists in the sense of uh, having a gifting for it, you know, what, what can we learn from that? Is it, is it, uh, just ability to be vulnerable and transparent and connect with, uh, with that, uh, dig into that suffering. What, what, from a personal level, what can we learn from those, those artists? Yeah. You know, uh, Frederick Buechner said, when, whenever you feel tears in your eyes, pay attention to them, listen to them. Uh, why are they there? You know? And, and I think, I think what artists tend to, what artists do is they try to, uh, really sort of capture, uh, the, the, the vulnerable moments of, of the human experience. This, they lean into that. They, they feel the things they feel pain deeply. They feel joy deeply. Um, I think that's a good exercise for us, uh, for us all is to, is to have practices in our lives where we, where we 
make ourselves feel. Uh, so if there are things that we do that bring us joy to, to not neglect those things, if there are things that we do, um, that help us to feel grief, um, that help us to lament, uh, like visiting gravesides, um, of people that we've lost and loved and, uh, going through photos and things like this, that it's, that it's important for us to, uh, to continue to cultivate and nurture, um, the, our emotional selves. Uh, and I, and I don't say this as somebody who's a real touchy feely person. Um, I can be, uh, but also I, I know that as a pastor, uh, I know what it's like to walk with people who have, um, because of their pain and because of suffering that they've experienced, uh, have begun to kind of shut off certain rooms of their heart where they're just not going to allow themselves to feel anymore. And it comes at great cost. And, and, uh, and I've also known people who have said, no, I'm, I'm going to pay attention, uh, to the things that I, that I feel, and I'm going to bring them to the Lord in prayer. And I'm going to have people in my life that I walk alongside who, who will be able to ask me how I'm doing and I'll be able to tell them how I'm doing. Um, it's a, it's such a significant part of what it means to be a human being in this world, and it's it's that's what the Book of Psalms are about. They're they're you know so many of the Psalms are given to us to help us know how to feel, um, and and to acknowledge the reality of of things like suffering and grief and shame, uh, and also the reality of of that feeling of of lonesomeness where you feel like God isn't even listening anymore. Um, you know, we have a number of Psalms that ask the Lord if he's sleeping uh, and how long he's going to be silent. And uh, I love that God in his kindness um, put those in the canon of scripture as a way of saying us saying to us, that's it's not out of bounds um, for you to say this to me. Uh, I'm, you can't say it rhetorically. Uh, you know, you can't say it hypothetically. I'll, there is an answer. Um, but, but, you know, the Lord made us to be people who move through this world as emotional beings. Uh, and so we have to pay attention mm. to it. Now that's really, really good advice. Uh, uh, you think about Jesus himself expressed so much emotion, you know, wept at Lazarus' tomb. He was um, angry at the money changers. You, see, you do see a lot of emotions, and he was being the perfect yeah. example of what a true human being should look like. So I think that's a good point. Artists, I guess, are good at helping us uh, yeah. identify some of those emotions. And are there some um, maybe practical ways in, you know, how can uh, you talk about writing? Uh, if we have particular ways to express Emotion. Are there particular disciplines or habits you think would be helpful for us as believers, or to to express those things to the Lord? I think I think um, writing with a pen and paper, in, or praying with a pen and paper in hand, uh, pen in hand, is a really good practice. Uh, not everybody fancies themselves to be writers, but but uh, but it's a good it's a good way of being able to. Um, think. I, I find that for me, writing is a way of of, of thinking clearly. Uh, and it's a way of also keeping a record of, of where I've been and, and what I've been going through. So I, I, I would highly recommend that. Um, and, you know, just, just leaning into the ways that the Lord made us to work, like getting getting sunshine, uh, you know, like taking walks and, and being active in the world, using our bodies and, and uh, savoring things. Um, you know, I had a seminary professor once who uh, he gave me this advice. He gave this advice to the class. He said, "If you're ever in a, in a restaurant, and they and and they bring out the sombrero or they start banging the drum because it's somebody's birthday, and they try to and they tell everybody to sing Happy Birthday as a Christian, you should sing Happy Birthday um, because you're in a moment." where it's not, and it's not as a being a witness to other people, but it's, it's, you're in a moment where people are acknowledging the dignity of personhood and they're celebrating somebody's existence. And as a Christian, you should sing happy birthday, um, <laughs> in the restaurant. And, and I've loved that advice because it, it, it applies to a lot of things, but I've also found myself in restaurants where I hear the drum coming down the hallway and I'm like, Oh, we're about to sing happy birthday to somebody. Uh, and, uh, because they're made in the image of God, I'm going to participate in that. So I think, I think just doing things like that, um, are good for us. I do think it's good. It's good to go to art museums. Um, if you live in a town where, where, if you live in a place where you're near one, um, you should go, uh, you should go. 
and uh, and 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 it will it will exhaust you uh, because art is exhausting um, because it's transcendent and it's engaging so much of you even when you don't feel it and you don't recognize it it's it's doing work on you uh, and you'll get uh, I call it museum feet where you just feel like your 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 feet have cinder blocks attached to them and um, but that's a good experience to have uh, per, put yourself in the path of things that are beautiful and good and true and do it regularly and do it intentionally. Do you, do you have a particular uh, advice about how you, how to approach a museum? I know I've been with some <laughs> yeah. people who, you know, you're going to, to the Louvre in, in France where you have all these, and, but it's almost like checking the block. Okay. We saw the Mona Lisa mm -hmm. check, mm -hmm. saw, you know, Venus de Milo check. Yeah. How, what's yeah. in a way to approach uh, this in a, in a transformative way for uh, museums and those types of things? You know, this goes back to, there's actually an appendix in the book about how to visit an art museum. It's called how to visit an art museum. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, for me, it is, if I go to an art museum, I'm, I'm, my agenda is to go find Van Gogh. Um, and if Rembrandt's there, I'll go find Rembrandt too. And, and what I won't try to do is take in the entire museum. Um, now I may end up going through every gallery in the museum before I'm done, but I'm not going in with, okay, I'm, I'm going to spend two hours and I'm going to digest this entire place. It's, nope, nope. Just go find, go find your people. Uh, like my art teacher said in high school, find, find the ones that you have a relationship with and then let them make some introductions. So if I'm in a room where there's a Van Gogh, I'll look at everything in that room. Um, and I'll read the little tombstones on the wall next to it that, that tell the stories. That's a really important thing to do is to read those. It, it will give you just so much information, not just about the painting, but about art itself. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I'll, I, I really, one of the encouragements that I would give anybody who's going to an art museum is don't feel like you need to have a degree in art history or art appreciation to like something. It, it is a valid form of art criticism to stand in front of a painting and say, I like this. Uh, and it's also valid to stand in front of a painting and say, I have no idea what's going on here. Um, that's okay. You, and you don't have to. And it's not, it's not a... Um, it's a it's a long game we're playing with art. It's a lifelong uh, endeavor, and so you know, get, let yourself off the hook of feeling like you have to understand everything you see, or even have to like everything you see, um, and just go visit your people and let them make some introductions. And maybe you'll pass something on the way uh, to Rembrandt that you want to circle back to and see, or you want to stop and look at. And, and then you're going to leave the museum with more uh, than you came in with. Um, I have a, I'm writing a follow-up to Rembrandt is in the wind uh, that'll be coming out in, in a year or so. And one of the appendices for that is um, called, I don't like Donatello and you can too. <laughs> um, it's, it's just about what, what do you do if there's a particular artist or kind of art that you just don't like and you don't connect with? Um, and uh, it's, it's fine <laughs> if, if there's art you don't like. That it's, that's not a problem. Uh, it would be weird um, if, if people just liked everything that they saw or connected with everything they saw. Uh, so... Um, yeah, that's it. I just, I'll go find my people, find Rembrandt and Van Gogh. And uh, now I'll find some others uh, because they've introduced me along the way. And, um, and, you know, trust that time is on my side. And if I get to go back to that museum another time, I might go someplace else. Um, but that's how I'll approach it. Oh, that's great. Are, are there any uh, contemporary artists or uh, you know, artists from Asia or Africa or other parts of the world? I think, you know, a lot of times, at least Growing up, I was primarily exposed, you know, to the the great masters of Europe and in America. But are there other artists that you found inspiring from other parts of the world or, or contemporary artists? Yeah, there's there's a lot of um, a lot a lot of Chinese art that uh, that I'm really fascinated by. Um, uh, Mako Fujimura, he's 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 Japanese, but he but he's here in, in the states. Um, but his art is fascinating to me. It's it's. Uh, because it changes a lot of his art, a lot of the stuff that he does because of the materials that he uses, it changes over time. So, so if you look at it now, uh, it'll, it'll be different than if you look at it in, in 10 years, um, just because of the elements that he uses. Um, so yeah, there's, there, there's a, there, there's a, um, this is kind of cheating uh, with the question, but there's a painter named Mark Maggiore, who's a Frenchman, uh, who, um, 
it paints the American West. Uh, and so he lives in, in uh, New Mexico and he paints these beautiful uh, cowboy pictures. Um, and uh, he's active on Instagram. If you follow him on Instagram, um, he's, he's a wonderful person to follow uh, as an artist because he, he shows you his technique. He shows you kind of works that are in progress. Um, but they're just, they're works that I just fall into. Uh, and it's, and it's fun to see this, this um, European painter who has really latched on to, um, you know, Arizona and New Mexico as, as kind of in Utah as his, as his uh, subject matter. Um, yeah. It's beautiful stuff. Now, uh, you mentioned Mark Fujimura and, and other, he's a little more abstract and, and how would you, I know for some of us, we're maybe more accustomed to realistic art or impressionist art, but that more abstract art, how, how, how would you say, uh, how should we approach art that's not realistic, but more of an abstract type of approach? I would say, give yourself grace to, un to know that there's going to be a learning curve there. Um, because for me, I have been um, slow to really appreciate a lot of the uh, more abstract um, art. And I, I th I'm thinking of Mark Rothko as, as an example of, of, I have grown to really love Rothko. Um, now he paints basically color fields, um, square, you know, like, like uh, squares and of different colors on, on painting. It, I'm, I'm doing a terrible job of describing Rothko. And uh, Rothko is, is an artist that y you really need to be in the presence of his paintings. So you, looking at them online won't quite do it. Uh, and I, I was going to the New York City and I was going to go to some art museums and a friend of mine said, oh, when you go to the Met, um, make sure you see the Rothkos. And I said, yeah, I don't, I don't, I've seen Rothko before. Like I've seen some of his stuff and I, I just don't get it. And she said, no, no, you, you just have to, you have to stand in front of it. She said, just stand in front of it for, and just look at it for 30 seconds and, and just tell me if it doesn't stir something in you. And lo and behold, I, I stood in front of a Rothko and just took it in and I wanted to weep. And I don't know why I still to this day don't know why. Um, but it's part of the transcendent quality of, of art. And there may be people who would say, I've seen Rothko's in person. They do nothing for me. There's nothing to it. Um, and to each his own in that sense. But, but <laughs> here I stand, I, I stood in front of a Rothko and, um, and it was one of the most moving experiences that I've ever had uh, in an art museum. And I've spent a lot of time in them. <laughs> uh, this might be a, uh... Unfair question, but if you had to pick one piece of art, what's the most impactful piece of art you've ever experienced and, and why? Hmm. That is a good question. Uh, you know, ask me on a different day and I'd probably give you a different answer. But but I think um, I think for me, it would probably what I'd say today <laughs> is uh, Rembrandt's Adoration of the Shepherds. Uh, which is a nativity scene. It's it's a, the the scene of they're in the stable. Uh, the source of light is actually Jesus himself. You you don't look at the painting and and think that's a painting of a glowing baby, but it, but it is. Uh, he is the light source in the painting. Um, but I was in London uh, earlier this year and making my way through the National Gallery. And I didn't prepare myself. I didn't. I didn't know what was in the National Gallery. Like I didn't have a list of things that I was there to see. And so I was looking at a um, at a Van Gogh, and turned around and and down a long series of of hallways, I saw a Rembrandt, uh, a self portrait. And I was with my daughter, and I said, "Ooh, look! There's there's a Rembrandt. Let's go look at it." And so we walked toward the Rembrandt, and I stood in front of it, and I looked at it, and then I turned around to point out something to my daughter. And when I turned around on the opposite wall, right behind me was the Adoration of the Shepherds by Rembrandt. And this is a painting that I've looked at digitally. I've looked at online photos of this for, for decades. But there it was in person. And I didn't know it was going to be there, first of all. It's always been a painting that I've loved. I didn't know it was there. It surprised me. And then when I walked over to it, it just, it was so much more magnificent than anything I'd ever seen online. Um, and it, it, you never know what size these things are. And so the size was, was not what I was expecting, but when I just caught it out of the corner of my eye, 
my heart leapt because I knew exactly what it was. I knew exactly what I was looking at. And it just drew me over. And my, my, my daughter actually being a, being a 20 year old, uh, videoed, took a video of me just sort of wandering over to this, like, like it had me in its tractor beam. Um, because she was like, I, it's happening. This thing you do, dad, where, where you, <laughs> you know, you, you just get transfixed by this, by these, these works of art and I lose you. And you just sort of go to this other place. And so she has a video of me just being awestruck, um, by this surprise encounter with that Rembrandt painting. Hmm. And, and what what is it about a painting like that that draws you closer to Christ? Uh, how, how does that affect your your spiritual life? I think it's it's the um, it, it's it's unfolding the story of the artist's personal life and seeing what they have created through a lens of understanding of who they were. Uh, that is what is what ministers most deeply to me. Uh, it's what the book is. The book is 10 stories. It's, it's not art history. It's not a- analysis. It's just storytelling. That's all it is. Um, and the reason, reason that's what it is, is because that's what captures my imagination and, and my uh, affection for the Lord is seeing how, look, I mean, as human beings, we're trying to find our way through a world that's broken and it's hard and it's, and things break and, we weep and we grieve and we celebrate and we taste and we touch and we, you know, all these things that are just part of the human experience. And, and for a painter like Van Gogh, for example, um, he is to me the striving man in Ecclesiastes. He's the guy who's trying to find the beauty and the meaning uh, and, and the reason for his existence. And he's doing it through painting. And, and he paints at this feverish pitch, uh, and he doesn't ever sell anything except for one painting. He sold one painting while he was alive. Um, and, and yet we look at him now as this, as this person who we regard as the consummate artist. He's the one who, who seemed to understand what nobody else was getting. And, um, and so as you get to know those stories of, of the suffering we talked about earlier, and then you see the work that was produced while he, while Rembrandt was grieving the loss of his wife, uh, you see the paintings that he painted. The grief is there. Um, the yearning for redemption is there. It's, it's all there. And, and, uh, and it's so moving. So uh, for me, the, the great joy for me when it comes to studying art is just studying the stories behind the people uh, who create these, these things that, that, um, that the world has seemed to re- recognize um, is transcendent and should be housed in a place where people can come uh, and see this and should be preserved forever. Uh, and, and that's a, that's, that's pretty profound to me. You mentioned uh, in your own life, uh, middle school and uh, art teachers giving you some advice about how to approach art in the world. Uh, being a, a parent yourself now and, and uh, what words of advice would you give uh, to children today about how they should uh, approach art, artists, creativity, and kind of what words of advice would you have for them as, as they uh, begin their journey? Well, I would say a couple of things. One is I would say, put yourself in the, in the presence of great art. Uh, go to art museums. You won't regret it. Um, the other thing I would say is understand that, that any creative endeavor is a craft. Uh, it's not something that you don't know how to do one day, and then you do know how to do the next day. It's something that you get to spend your entire life practicing and learning how to do and uh, making mistakes with. Um, and and it's whether you're writing songs or you're painting or you're drawing or you're writing poetry or you're cooking, um, all of these these creative endeavors, and there's so many more, um, are, are things that we get to practice in this life. We don't just do them, but we practice them. Uh, and so we, we hone a skill and, and the better we become at something, the more joy we will derive from it, that mastery begets joy. And, uh, so if you can be kind to yourself, have patience, um, understand that you will, you will never master anything, um, fully, but you will, you can become really, really good at things. Uh, and in the process of becoming really, really good at something, you understand complexities 
behind it, you, you understand the joy of, of what you're able to do with it. Uh, and, um, and so uh, I would approach, I would say, approach it as a craft and as a lifelong endeavor, uh, not something that you're just going to get, get a handle on before the end of the summer, <laughs> you know, but that this is something you'll just, you'll just, it'll be part of your life. And maybe a, just a, a final words, uh, you know, I think uh, sometimes within the Christian community, uh, artists have oftentimes been on the fringe, you might say, or, and there are even some who, uh, I don't call, I think CSO Lewis called them iconoclasts, but kind of the idol smashers, but people who would say, you know, Christians really shouldn't be involved in necessarily in the arts or at least in a public way or in, a, in, in front of the world. Any, any advice in that regard for how we as believers should approach just the whole idea theologically about art, artists, and creativity? Well, I think, I think that um, uh, w- one of the things I appreciate about this question is that it's a very Western question, um, that we can be very, very pragmatic with things and say, if this doesn't um, clearly deliver something for me or do something for me or advance me in some way, then I'm going to question its, its usefulness. Um, art defies that art says you can ask about the usefulness of art all day long and it will not give you an answer. Um, and that's part of its usefulness. <laughs> part of its usefulness is to check us and to say, no, no, we're not just here to, uh, to learn principles for living. We're here to live, uh, and, and to experience life and life is a multifaceted thing made by, God. Uh, the other thing I would say about that that's very, very important is if you if you say that you want to know God uh, or, or you want to have a good handle on theology and engaging with art and beauty is not part of your, your, your process, you will miss very significant realities of who God is. Because one of the things that we learn early on about the Lord uh, is that he is too glorious to behold, that glory is a part of his nature. It's a part of who he is. And it's a, and it's such a part of who he is, such a powerful part of who he is that when Moses wants to see him, God says, it'll kill you. Uh, my glory will be too much for you. Um, so when we practice being in the presence of beauty and we put ourselves in the path of beauty, whether it's paintings of the American West or Rembrandt or a sunset whatever it is, when, we, or when we're intentionally putting ourselves in the path of beautiful things, it is a way of knowing God better uh, because he is the author of beauty and he is beautiful himself. Uh, he is too radiant to behold, but we're meant to know him as he is. And, uh, and so when we, when we um, don't engage beauty and we don't engage art, uh, or music, or things like this uh, that that uh, that stir the soul. Uh, we're we're cheating ourselves um, because God is radiant and beautiful and compelling and loving and all of these things that are that are uh, that are tied to the to the idea of of transcendent beauty. And so we have to we have to. Well, wow, thank you so much, Russ. What a wonderful way to uh, wrap up our time here today. I uh, really appreciate you, you taking some time with us. And uh, I really encourage people to uh, check out Russ's book, uh, Rembrandt is in the Wind. It's a wonderful read. I think you'll find it uh, very inspiring and, and helpful in your own life. So thank you, Russ, for being with us. Yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I can't believe we're, it's, it's already over. <laughs> Goes quick, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. Well, those of you who uh, uh, have watched this video and this interview, I, I just uh, want to thank you for joining us. And I want to thank uh, Russ for his time with us. I hope uh, that uh, you'll continue to find ways in your lives uh, to see the beautiful creation of our God and to see his beauty uh, through art and through the world uh, today. Uh, the CSO Institute is able to do virtual events like this and others uh, due to the generosity of people like yourselves who give financially to this ministry. So I'd like to ask you to prayerfully consider making a gift to, tonight via um, our website or by text. And there'll be information on the screen on how to do that. As well, there's information on the publications and programs of the CSO Institute, and they can be found uh, not only on the screen here tonight, but at our website, cssoinstitute.org. 
Uh, may God equip us all to be spokespersons and artists who communicate the beauty, goodness, and truth of Christ in our world today. God bless you.